Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments practice workgroup webinar on combating the threat of antibiotic resistance in the food production sector. My name is Lisa Hartmeyer. I am co-chair of the Annie practice workgroup. We are very excited for this presentation today. Just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, please keep yourself on mute uh, during the presentation. Um, and the format of this is going to be that we'll have the presentation and that there'll be time at the end for questions and answers. Um, so please feel free as we're going along to um, type in your questions and answers into the chat box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, I would like to introduce the speakers and I'd also like to introduce Abby Anderson, who will be helping me moderate the question and answer session at the end. Abby is a master's of public health student at the University of San Francisco, and she's interested in studying environmental health factors that impact our health. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our speakers today. Madeline Cleven is spent many years primarily in a laboratory setting researching several infectious organisms and their impact on public health. She completed her graduate degree in public health at UC Berkeley with an emphasis in infectious disease and vaccinology in 2018, and has been working as the Safe and Healthy Food Program Associate at the Food Animal Concerns Trust and as the lead coordinator of Keep Antibiotics Working for nearly three years. We are very pleased to have her today. I'd also like to introduce John Stoddard who is the National Project Manager for the Healthcare Without Harm's Healthy Food and Healthcare Program. He leads the organization's work with the healthcare sector on the intersection between food and climate. John coordinates efforts to reduce meat purchasing and to implement plant-forward menus in healthcare through the Cool Food Pledge and works to promote regenerative agriculture as a climate solution. He earned his Master's of Science from Tufts University Friedman School of Nutrition, specializing in agriculture, food, and the environment program. Without further ado, please take it away. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, Lisa. Um, so I'll be presenting first kind of on the coalition's work as a whole in the agriculture sector, and then John will share some more information towards the end, kind of on the intersection of the ag sector and healthcare. So um, like Lisa said, my name is Madeline Clevin, and I'm the Safe and Healthy Food Pro Program Associate at the nonprofit organization Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT for short. And I'm a coordinator of Keep Antibiotics Working. So FACT actually leads Keep Antibiotics Working, which is a national coalition of 20 advocacy groups, including FACT and Healthcare Without Harm, all working to slow the spread of antibiotic resistant bacteria by stopping the overuse of antibiotics in animal agriculture. So our work mainly focuses on federal policy and corporate initiatives, both of which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So on this slide, you can kind of see all of the official KW member organizations. Um, however, I want to mention that we work with several other great advocacy groups who sign on to letters of ours or participate in um, different campaigns and initiatives. So there's plenty of room for growth in KW. The issues we're working on don't seem to be going away anytime soon. So um, there are lots of ways for people to get involved. Um, Okay, so um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with antibiotic resistance and the critical threat it poses to global public health. And um, so as Professor John Middleton has said, a future world where bugs are all resistant to antibiotics will return us to the dark days of ineffective healthcare and condemn many to early deaths animal health and human health must be equally protected to save our antibiotics. Antibiotics are certainly one of the cornerstones of modern medicine. They're critical for so many medical interventions from respiratory infections to surgery or chemotherapy. And I'm sure all of you can name countless others. So a world where our antibiotics no longer work is truly frightening. And unfortunately, at this point, even if we rekindle the antibiotic pipeline to find new medicines, 
without significant changes in how they're used and a shift in stewardship practices will continue to fuel the antibiotic resistance crisis. So according to the World Health Organization, drug resistant infections could cause 10 million deaths each year by 2050 if no significant action is taken. And as Professor Middleton and many others have said, significant action really must be taken on both the human and animal side. Since the beginning of civilization, animal and human health have been very closely tied together. And we definitely see that in our day. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, three out of every four new or emerging infectious diseases in people come from animals. And we see many resistant infections coming from animals as well. In the latest threat report that was released by CDC, two of the threats deemed serious, which together account for almost a quarter of the national drug resistant infections are resistant salmonella and resistant campylobacter. And we know most salmonella and campylobacter infections come from animals. Salmonella from eating contaminated food products or from contact with feces from infected animals or people, including touching animals and their surroundings and campylobacter from raw or undercooked chicken, unpasteurized milk, contaminated food, and also through direct contact with animals. I think um, two of the other threats that were mentioned in the report were drug resistant um, E. coli, um, as well as MRSA. And we see transmission of these pathogens from animals as well. So in order to really protect people from antibiotic resistance, we need to protect animals as well. There's this critical linkage between the two. So why does KW focus on animal agriculture and farms specifically? So for a couple of reasons, but the primary reason being we want to stop or slow the development of superbugs on farms. So if you look at this fun graphic of a superbug origin story, um, you can see how drug resistance and then multi-drug resistance occurs. And it starts with a very common process. So bacteria that are residing in the Inside the animals, they'll replicate by the millions. And through that replication process, the bacteria will develop mutations in their genetic code. So some of these mutations will confer resistance to an antibiotic. And when that antibiotic is given, susceptible bacteria are eliminated, allowing antibiotic resistant bacteria to survive and proliferate leading to this gradual increase in the proportion of bacteria that are now resistant. So the more an antibiotic is used, the more bacteria resistant to that antibiotic will dominate. Then when veterinarians switch to other antibiotics or other antibiotic classes, the process repeats. So over time, bacteria become resistant to more and more drugs and as you can see by the cape and the red eyes, they become increasingly more menacing. And um, these multi-drug resistant organisms then become present in animal feces and can contaminate meat at slaughter or during packing, or they can be washed downstream to other farms, maybe raising food, and they can get into the environment eventually making their way to humans and causing very difficult to treat illness. And unfortunately, while we all are definitely at risk of getting these infections, the people working in the meat industry face even higher risks. Workers in frequent contact with food animals during slaughter or with meat products derived from them, which are routinely contaminated with antibiotic resistant bacteria, 
can become infected and carry these bugs into their homes and then communities. And then this kind of cycle continues. Um, now we're especially concerned about farms and feedlots um, because whereas antibiotic sales in human medicine have remained rather consistent since 2009, despite the year-on-year -year increase in the U.S. population. In contrast, sales of these same drugs for use in livestock have increased, and livestock sales are now nearly double the sales for human medicine. And these are just medically important antibiotics. So medically important antibiotics, which I'll use that term a lot today, are antibiotics that are shared between humans and animals. These are the drugs we really worry about overusing in animals because not only do bacteria resistant to medically important antibiotics limit treatment options for animals, but they limit treatment options for humans as well. Now we're seeing resistance on farms and feedlots to drugs like carbapenem, cephalosporins, linezolid, and colistin, which are reserved for last resort treatment options in humans. Um, I think it was in 2019, World Animal Protection, who is one of our KW member organizations, they did testing of pork um, from one of the United States largest grocery chains and found bacteria resistant to multiple antibiotics um, important to human medicine. Um, they found 80% of the bacteria isolated from the pork products were resistant to at least one antibiotic um, that was medically important. 37% of the bacteria were resistant to three or more classes of antibiotics, and nearly 10% um, were resistant to a total of six classes of medically important antibiotics. So pretty horrifying. Um, definitely take a look at their report if you want. I can send the link um, that you may think twice about buying bacon or sausage again. Um, but I'll mention that in addition to farms, um, we see a lot of the same um, process with antibiotic resistance occurring in the seafood industry um, and with um, seafood farming and aquaculture, but FACT doesn't really focus a lot on seafood. Um, other member organizations do, but um, we don't do a whole lot of work in that sector. So for the purposes of this presentation, I'll be mostly focusing on livestock and poultry, but it's worth noting that these similar processes are definitely happen happening for fish as well. So in these next slides, I'll really talk about the main focuses of KW's efforts and how we're working to stop the overuse and misuse of antibiotics in food animal production and in turn reduce antibiotic resistance. So firstly, we're working to eliminate routine use. KW demands a ban on using antibiotics on farms for purposes other than treating sick or injured animals or for controlling diagnosed outbreaks of disease. So antibiotics are still important to use to treat animals when they're really sick or suffering, but we don't think they should be used preventively. Currently, FDA guidelines and drug labels allow for the feeding of antibiotics to compensate for poor animal welfare. So FDA defines disease prevention as the administration of a drug to a group of animals, none of which have been diagnosed with the indicated disease, but when the introduction of pathogens is anticipated. So feedlots already know and anticipate animals will get sick because of early weaning, improper diets, stressful conditions. So they'll get antibiotics to prevent illness, 
and a lot of these feedlots, rather than addressing the root cause of the disease, they'll just keep giving antibiotics. And unfortunately, um, FDA allows this through current regulations. Now, some drugs are only approved for disease control. There are three main terms on animal drug labels and approvals, so prevention, control, and treatment. And they're all defined differently by FDA. So control is defined as feeding antibiotics to a group of animals with at least some sick animals. But farmers will kind of stretch this definition. So in the case of ceftiafur, um, which is a third generation cephalosporin, um, critically important to human medicine, it's often given to pigs routinely at birth and during processing when none of the baby pigs are clinically ill. The farms most likely try to consider it um, control of respiratory disease during times of stress, but um, many, like including KW, believe this is most likely an extra label or illegal use of this drug. Um, Unfortunately, the definitions of prevention, control, and treatment are still relatively unclear. And we do allow preventive uses for several antibiotics. So the practice of giving antibiotics to animals who aren't sick, whether under the umbrella of prevention or quote unquote control is pretty common. The World Health Organization has called for an end to the practice of preventive use, citing major concerns that preventive use contributes to antimicrobial resistance. And in October, the European Parliament voted to limit the use of preventive antibiotics to individual animals and only when a veterinarian believes there's a high risk of infection. And this becomes law in January, 2022. And, and the US is definitely behind. Um, interestingly, research has shown, um, so like this paper you can see to the right, um, that the removal of prophylactic in-feed antibiotics is possible with only minor reductions in productive performance and health, which can be addressed by improved husbandry practices. So you can have just as efficient animals um, raised on farms without these preventive um, antibiotics if you just improve husbandry a little bit. Now, I wanna bring up as well FDA guidance for Industry 213, which went into effect in 2017. And this was a big step because it required veterinary oversight, basically prescriptions of medically important antibiotics and made it illegal to use them as, as growth promoters. So medically important antibiotics can't be used to make animals grow faster. Now, I will say, even though it was a big step, again, we're very behind in the US. I think in 1999, the European Union um, kind of implemented an antibiotic resistance monitoring program and a plan to change this practice. And by 2006, they had phased out antibiotic use for the purposes of growth promotion. So in the US, even though medically important antibiotics can't be used to make animals grow faster, they can still be used in animals that aren't sick. So we're working hard to change this and our European counterparts and the WHO recommends it. So I think we can, we can as a country make this change as well. In addition, KW would like to see a numeric and time-bound national goal to reduce non-human uses of medically important antibiotics, especially in food animal production. The literature shows that interventions that restrict antibiotic use in food producing animals can reduce antibiotic resistant bacteria in these animals by up to 39% which makes sense. 
many papers, including the one um, to the left, show that the emergence of antibiotic resistant superbugs is highly correlated with selective pressure that results from the overuse of antibiotics. Like we discussed in the superbug origin story, selective pressure is the influence exerted by some environmental factor on the ability of a group of organisms to survive and reproduce. In this case, antibiotics are that factor. When you remove the selective pressure, you get less resistance. One important aspect of the selection pressure or overall use, um, which contributes to antibiotic resistance, is duration of use. So the longer an antibiotic is used, the more likely resistance will develop. So we not only want to see a reduction in overall use, but a reduction in the amount of time that these antibiotics are used. And we know from both human and animal medicine that setting shorter durations of use for antibiotics lowers the incidence of antimicrobial resistance. Unfortunately, one third of medically important antibiotics sold for use in animal feed or drinking water carry labels with no stated duration or time limit for how long they can be fed to flocks or herds. Um, on January 11th, 2021, after much delay, um, the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine finally released a draft concept paper titled The Potential Approach for Defining Durations of Use for Medically Important Antimicrobial Drugs Intended for Use in or on Feed. So this was a big step because FDA is now looking to set duration limits for those medically important antibiotics that don't have them. But under the current proposal that they released, um, it would take until the year 2030 to establish duration limits to the point where those restrictions actually appear on all relevant product labels. And there are a few other kind of issues with the proposal, um, but this was just their concept paper. So they'll need to, they're getting comments and then they're going to draft um, a draft guidance, which they'll release and ask for comments on again. And then they'll put out a guidance, like guidance 213, like I mentioned before. And then that will actually give the guidelines for how they're going to set these duration limits. So we're really pushing FDA, FDA on this because it will be a, a really important step to um, reducing the development of antimicrobial resistance in the food production sector. So how do we actually make it possible to reduce the amount of time we're giving antibiotics to animals? Or how do we make it possible for farms to reduce even overall use? So in order to do that, KW expects farms to prevent disease by providing appropriate diets, delaying weaning, improving hygiene, reducing crowding, and using vaccines appropriately so that antibiotic use on farms is rare rather than routine. So it's been proven again and again that actually improving animal welfare and raising healthier animals reduces the need for antibiotics. And if you think about it, really the same goes for humans as well. The better conditions in which we live, the less opportunities there are for disease transmission, the less likely we are to get sick and need antibiotics. Raising healthier animals um, is always a better way to go. <laughs> Sadly, under current conditions in most 
concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs and industrial farming facilities, which you can see to the right. Um, animals are placed in environments where disease is rampant and poor conditions lead to frequent illness and subsequent treatment with antibiotics. Currently, the industry values quantity over quality, and this is worsening the antibiotic resistance crisis. Simple changes in husbandry practices can make a huge difference. So for example, increasing weaning age for pigs. So the amount of time that baby pigs get to stay with their mothers um, is associated with lower antimicrobial usage from birth until slaughter. So not only does this like simple intervention decrease the need for antibiotics in baby pigs during their first kind of years of life or even first weeks of life, but it decreases the need for antibiotics until slaughter their whole lives. There are a few drugs like um, Tylosin, whose use could definitely be lessened or prevented. So when cattle are given high grain diets, they're more likely to develop liver abscesses and in turn be treated with the drug Tylosin. So when cows eat the typical grain rich feedlot diet, the carbohydrate overload can make the cow's stomach more acidic and change its bacterial population. So a more acidic rumen can then lead to lesions in the stomach and the stomach wall that allow this change in bacteria and all these bacteria to then invade the bloodstream, lodge into the liver and form abscesses. But changing cattle from feed to pasture and allowing them to graze and forage on grass reduces the overall incidence of liver abscesses. So not only that, but it also provides space and a healthier environment where cattle are much less likely to get sick. And just changing from giving cows all this grain to maybe even giving them a little bit of time on pasture or some grass um, could definitely help. Even if concentrated animal feeding operations implemented one or two practices to improve animal health and well being, we could see a really large drop in antibiotic use. Because of the sheer size and the amount of animals these operations are raising, one small change could have a huge effect on the industry. Of more than 30,000 feedlots operating today, the 571 largest ones, so those that have 5,000 animals or more, produce three quarters of all the feedlot finished cattle, which is almost 19 million animals. And when it comes to slaughtering the cattle and meat packing, four companies, Cargill, Tyson, JBS, and National Beef control more than 80% of all US beef meat packing. So imagine if these companies had improved antibiotics policies, improved animal welfare policies in place, then that would significantly change the industry as a whole. So KW also advocates for the collection of antibiotic use data on farms. Surveillance systems that describe what, when, where, and how antibiotics are actually used on US farms and feedlots um, are really needed to inform policy change and develop strategies to reduce AMR and improve welfare. 
there's very little transparency or accountability in the livestock industry, especially in beef and swine regarding antibiotic use. The industry does not directly report on farm or on feedlot use of antibiotics, despite recommendations from federal agencies and organizations to do so. And this hampers progress in reducing overuse of antibiotics and slowing resistance. NOMS, which stands for the National Animal Health Monitoring System, is an agency within USDA that conducts voluntary studies in the livestock sector. So they provide surveys to farms and ask them to give rather limited information on antibiotic use, stewardship practices, and veterinary oversight. So this is the only source of this type of data for the United States. So we're very glad there's something, but overall the USDA's collection and reporting on-farm antibiotic use in general is incomplete and is most likely not a very good representative sample of the industry as a whole because these surveys are voluntary. So maybe farms or feedlots which use a lot more antibiotics don't necessarily want to participate in this survey and report that. And in addition, they're actually losing voluntary participation. So sadly, the data may prove to be even less representative in future reports. Unfortunately, the studies also don't actually collect information on how antibiotics are used. So instead, they ask livestock producers whether an antibiotic was used during the last six months, and in some cases, what percentage of the animals on the farm received it. Since drugs can be given at different doses and durations or to the same animal multiple times, this type of data doesn't allow the straightforward measurement of the amount of drugs used. And in the last report that came out from NOMS, which was on beef cattle and swine, um, it was the numbers from 2017. They also cited, especially in the beef study, confidentiality concerns as a reason why they didn't report really important data collected on reason for use and duration of certain widely used antibiotics. So then we didn't, we were missing a big chunk of really important data even in these studies. So in addition to NOMS, we have annual sales data that comes out from the FDA, but sales really don't equate to use. KW is really pushing governmental organizations like USDA, FDA, and the Department of Health and Human Services to collect this data, and we're hoping to see progress soon. Luckily, we have some information, but we definitely need more. Um, to the right, sorry for the really small text. Um, this is a timeline we put together that was titled A Sorted History of Antibiotic Data Collection. So it lists almost all of the times federal agencies have recommended the need for antibiotic use data or taken some steps to implement a system or listed this as a priority. But as you can see, it's been 22 years. And though we've made some progress, there's been a lot of talk with not much action. And this is something that's truly needed. So KW is working really hard to get a national data collection system. And we recently presented a strategy to the Secretary of Health and Human Services on feed mills as a potential source of this data. So existing FDA rules require feed mills to keep records of the amount of antibiotics distributed to farms and feedlots, the reason for use, and then the type of animals receiving them. 
the rules also require feed mills to make these records available to the FDA for inspection and copying. So we're hoping that um, the Department of Health and Human Services and FDA can build a system to comprehensively collect data from the firms that, man that manufacture and distribute medicated animal feeds that contain medically important antibiotics, and then hopefully publicly report these data. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> Along with the collection of yeast data, KW supports collecting data on the spread of resistant superbugs in the food system in order to track trends. NARMS, um, lots of acronyms, is the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System. Um, it was established, I think around 1996, and it's a collaboration among state and local health departments, CDC, the FDA, and USDA. So it's a national public health surveillance system that tracks changes in antimicrobial susceptibility of certain enteric bacteria that are found in ill people, retail meats, and food animals. So CDC provides data on people, FDA on retail meats, and USDA on food animals. Unfortunately, it lacks geographic depth on the animal side and doesn't collect from farms, but instead at slaughter. So we still have gaps in knowledge, but we have been able to work a lot with FDA to make recommendations on how to improve norms on the animal side. And recently, actually, they've added a pilot project sampling surface waters to norms, and we hope this system just continues to expand. And KW as a whole would just like to see more on-farm monitoring in general. So COVID-19 has truly shaken the nation and spurred the administration to develop a pandemic preparedness plan and a surveillance system for monitoring zoonotic diseases and threats that emerge in animals. Now, it's impossible to adequately identify emerging pandemic threats without monitoring one of the most important interfaces of human and animal health, um, and that's farms and feedlots. So you can kind of see to the right, but recently the American Rescue Plan Act was passed, and there's a section in there that provides $300 million for a surveillance program for SARS-CoV-2. USDA is specifically in charge of developing um, this system. And in their proposal, they mention wanting to strengthen surveillance on not only emerging threats like SARS-CoV-2, but also antimicrobial resistant bacteria. So we submitted comments to the USDA applauding the inclusion of AMR surveillance in their strategy. And we just urged them to make sure that surveillance in animals is occurring on farms and feedlots, as well as other environments. Antimicrobial resistance is such an important part of pandemic preparedness and should be monitored at the same time as these other emerging threats. So lastly, I wanted to bring up our corporate work. Um, through the Antibiotics Off the Menu Coalition, which is a group of organizations, primarily KW members, we're working to stop the overuse of antibiotics in the meat industry through corporate actions. As some of the largest purchasers of meat in the country, we're urging these corporations to leverage their buying power to drive industry-wide change. So since 2015, we've annually reviewed and rated the top fast food and fast casual restaurant chains in the US on the antibiotics use policies and practices behind the beef, pork, chicken, and turkey sold in their stores. We also look at overall transparency in regards to antibiotics used in meat and poultry supply chains. And these results are all published in reports called Chain Reaction. Um, here is actually the scorecard from our latest report. Um, 
And Antibiotics Off the men Menu continues to urge the top six restaurant chains in the US to only buy meat raised without routine antibiotic use. Through our efforts, all of these chains have implemented commitments in chicken, but only four of the top six have pledged to take action on beef. So McDonald's who made a commitment in 2018 to set antibiotic reduction targets across 85% of its global beef supply chain by the end of 2020 has not followed through. It's now the end of 2021, it's been a year and they still haven't set these reduction targets. Um, so we're working hard to push them to fulfill this commitment since they're the largest beef purchaser in the country. Um, so you can see in the bottom right, this is an active petition we have going on our website, um, urging them to follow through on their commitment. And um, I think I'll be probably sharing these slides and you can also look at our website and feel free to sign the petition. So I know I'm running a little bit short on time, so you can go back, I'm sure, and read some of these. But um, I just wanted to say that um, I've talked a lot about the issues we're working on, ways in which we're trying to make changes, and the ways in which the industry is behind or struggling. But I really need to mention that through our collaborative model, our coalition members have really enacted sizable change in the way food is produced from farms and animals in the US. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but I wanted to list some of the policies we're working on. There's plenty we want to see federal agencies do in terms of establishing new policies, such as setting reduction targets for overall use or eliminating routine use. But these are some of the ongoing federal policies that we've provided stakeholder input on or are actively commenting on. And then sorry to go through these a little bit fast. But um, before I turn the time over to John, um, I just wanted to say we'd love for all of you to be involved in our ongoing work. We're constantly trying to pressure FDA and food companies and often have action alerts running where supporters can submit comments directly to the agencies and companies. Um, these are two of our action alerts going, I mentioned the McDonald's one. Um, please feel free to visit the website, visit the sites of our member organizations. I know you're currently digesting a lot of information I've thrown at you, but um, the takeaway should be that there are always ways for you to make a change for good and preserve our antibiotics. So thank you. Thanks, Madeline. That was a really excellent presentation. Um, very interesting and it's motivated me. Um, I hope others are motivated to take action. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that's why I'm here, um, just to finish us up with um, some actions that those in healthcare can take on this issue. Um, so I wanted to just tell you a brief, uh, a little bit about Healthcare Without Harm. We were founded over 25 years ago instigated by the belief that as the only sector with healing as its mission, healthcare has the opportunity to use its ethical, economic, and political influence to create ecologically sustainable, equitable, and healthy communities. And our mission is to transform healthcare worldwide so that it reduces its environmental footprint, becomes a community anchor for sustainability, and a leader in the global movement for environmental health and justice. We conduct research, model strategic interventions, and provide guidance and resources to spread and accelerate best practices in the field. And we have programs focused on climate and health, safer chemicals, and healthy food, healthy food and others. And to give you a sense of our network, we work with about 1,400 hospitals in the US and globally um, more than 1,300 um, hospitals in 65 countries. And next slide, please. So um, 
Healthcare Without Harms Healthy Food and Healthcare Program is what, what I work for. And we were launched, um, the program was launched in 2005 and works to harness the expertise, purchasing power, and investments of the healthcare sector to advance the development of a sustainable food system. And I'm just, since we're a little short on time, I'm just going to, oh, I, I should point out actually um, just this graphic here um, in the front. Um, showing that 66% um, of the folks in our network are, are reporting that they're working to reduce um, the purchases of meat um, raised with non-therapeutic antibiotics. And now we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> and I'm just going to finish us off today with um, a couple ways for you to take action and get involved. Um, so first off is organizing, in, you know, if you work in a hospital, in a, in a healthcare system, to organize the adoption of an antibiotics resolution, which essentially commits the hospital to phasing out purchases of meat raised with non-therapeutic antibiotics. And we have um, a toolkit for you to do that with suggested language. You can see that under um, the section general under resources with the antibiotic stewardship toolkit. And this presentation, I believe, will be emailed to all of you and you get all these links um, that I've included in this slide. Um, healthcare food service is a $12 billion a year industry. So just getting an idea of that purchasing power. So if you adopt this, um, this resolution to not purchase or to phase out the purchases of meat raised with um, non-therapeutic um, antibiotics, the, your hospital, the system, and the sector can have a huge impact. Once your resolution is passed, we have a number of resources for food service. You can see all them listed there. So um, your food service, our understanding labels guide can help a food service operator to you know, determine which labels to look for when purchasing meat. Uh, there's a procurement guide as well that goes along with that. We also have a product database on our website that has a number of different products um, and brands that you can buy that um, are raised, uh, meat products raised responsibly. Um, and, you know, if you don't... Uh, Food service can certainly um, take action in these ways using these resources without a policy. Um, however, a policy really ensures that the action will be taken. And it's also useful for sharing with vendors and suppliers. So, you know, when talking with a vendor, you can say we have this policy, they can read it, and then it's very clear to them. Another action you can take is to incorporate um, overuse in agriculture into stewardship programs. So evidence has demonstrated that hospital-based antibiotic stewardship programs significantly reduce hospital rates of antibiotic resistant infections. However, most of these ASPs fail to address upstream causes of greater community exposure to antibiotic resistant bacteria through the misuse of antibiotics outside the hospital. So we have another toolkit for you to use. It's our antibiotic stewardship through animal agriculture toolkit. You can see that um, under the resources for providers. And um, the toolkit module provides tools to incorporate this important aspect of stewardship into your um, existing program. And then um, the th an another action you can take is to use your voice. Um, Polls consistently show that health professionals rank as some of the most trusted professionals in the United States. You can, as a health professional, you can leverage your knowledge of, of, about and commitment to protecting public health and influence elected officials to support policies and that protect antibiotics. And you can provide testimonies, participate in letter writing campaigns and visit with poly, policymakers. Um, to assist you in that, you can join the Clinical Champions in Comprehensive Antibiotic Stewardship. That's the last link there under for providers. That the, um, the collaborative is a joint committee of Healthcare Without Harm, 
the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society, sharing antimicrobial microbial reports for pediatric stewardship and the US Public Interest Research Group. And the collaborative aims to increase the knowledge within the clinical community of the link between antibiotic resistance and antibiotic use in agriculture and to promote policy action that supports judicious, judicious, wow, judicious use. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, the la and the last um, action you can take is to promote plant forward menus in, in your facility. So you can see under food service, I have a link to plant forward future. There are um, many reasons to reduce our meat consumption. Meat, um, meat, represent, meat production represents a big chunk of, um, of climate change emis emissions. Um, the agriculture industry is responsible for something like 30% of global emissions. Um, but you know, reduce as as Madeline was 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 um, saying in her presentation, improving animal hu husbandry and the conditions of animals is essential to address this issue. Um, that can result in more expensive meat potentially. Um, so we've always taken at Healthcare Without Harm a less meat, better meat approach. So the idea is to not necessarily eliminate all animal products, but reduce your animal products. And then when you are purchasing meat, use that savings to um, purchase um, better meat, uh, particularly meat that's raised um, with responsible antibiotic use. So I will stop there and we've got about eight minutes left. Wow, thank you so much. Um, there's so much information there and so much work to be done. Um, I'd like to um, have Abby Anderson um, help out with moderating some of those questions. We got some really good ones. Um, um, Abby, would you like to ask some of the questions? Yes, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much, Madeline and John. That was such a lovely presentation. Um, and we have some great questions that were asked during the presentation. Um, firstly, what was your biggest takeaway from this project in learning about this issue? I, I don't know if that's directed at Madeline or John, but maybe both of you can have a take on it. Um, yeah, so what was my initial response to? Um, well, I think, um, yeah, like I said, some things, especially when you kind of dive into the nitty gritty, are a little bit horrifying about um, the industry as a whole. And it um, it really makes you want to kind of push for change and um, makes you realize, too, that change kind of starts at the individual level. And then you really need to kind of garner support from a lot of different organizations, from a lot of different people in governmental um, positions and things like that to really then try to enact policy change and make like a bigger difference as a whole. But um, yeah, I think it was really overwhelming at first, um, but then um, kind of learning more, you realize that there are a lot of people who care about this issue and there's definitely like opportunity um, to enact change, even if you're just a individual person. Uh, I would just say I think it's pretty remarkable um, sort of both you know how how issues in the food system directly affect healthcare you know how um, as a nurse or a physician a PA um, you're you're seeing um, you know you're dealing with sort of the the ramifications of of what might be happening at the farm level and then also on the flip side of that, just how much um, power there is in healthcare so as an industry um, with major purchasing power. And then as a clinician, um, you know, using your voice, as I mentioned, um, you know, I just, I think sort of two sides of the same coin, just how much healthcare is affected, but then how much opportunity there is um, as a healthcare provider and as someone that works in a hospital. Oh, great answers. Um, the second question is, how do you think companies could be swayed to make these changes related to beef purchasing? 
Um, yeah, it's a great question considering yeah, we're really trying to do that exact thing, um, like big corporations like McDonald's and such. And um, we definitely have seen um, success with getting, so like I said, antibiotics off the menu as a whole, we're a group of multiple coalitions um, who each have, I think in the upwards of like hundreds of thousands of supporters and, um, we've really tried to like leverage all of that support by, um, you know, getting all those supporters to sign petitions or go out and like um, go and actually like um, do kind of events and things at these like, so at a McDonald's or at a Wendy's, for example. And we've noticed that's made a big difference. Like kind of tapping into those supporters and tapping into the media because I mean when it comes down to it these big corporations yeah like McDonald's or Wendy's um, rely on consumers to make money and have their business thrive so if consumers are distressed and they don't like their beef purchasing policies and they become more educated and then they make that known, then a lot of times these companies will listen. So that's kind of what we've been trying to do is um, use our supporters, kind of talk to different board members, use other organizations to, and the media to really push these companies to make a change and just put a lot and a lot of pressure on them, I guess. Yeah. But we're always looking for new ways to do that too. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think a lot of that comes from food labeling as well, demanding better labels for consumers. And that kind of falls into maybe this is the last question we have time for, unfortunately. Um, but how can consumers of meat products really know what they're buying based on the label, the food labels or lack thereof? How can we make that more clear? for consumers? It's the first step. I would jump, I'll jump in on this one just to say that um, labels can be misleading um, and, uh, you know, kind of some greenwashing can, can happen. Um, the link that I, one of the links under food service understanding labels are labels that we have vetted that are meaningful. Um, so they're not just sort of uh, you know, a statement being made, but they're actually either um, third party certified or or legal, legal and backed um, by the FDA. So I would definitely refer to that because it it's easy to um, sort of see a label and and think that it everything's good, but it it might be misleading. Absolutely. Do we have time for maybe one more question, Lisa? Sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Last question. Um, what is the current data on the number of infections in human populations resulting from AMR in animal populations or products? Or what's the current estimate of cost for um, antimicrobial resistance? Um, yeah, so I don't know all of those numbers off the top of my head. If you do go and look at, like I brought up the CDC threat report, it's an amazing resource that goes through um, all of these different pathogens or these resistance threats. And it will actually, and it breaks it down by numbers of resistant infections. And I think there's also a number in, I think the billions of dollars on the CDC threat report as well that mentions, um, yeah, the economic costs of antimicrobial resistance. And I mentioned a little bit in the presentation, NARMS. Um, so NARMS also has like, you can look up specific like human enteric illnesses and a lot of those, um, it will also, it lists what, resi what type of resistance there is to that pathogen. And yeah, so you can look up 
Campylobacter cases or Salmonella cases, or I think E. coli cases, and you'll be able to see um, kind of the numbers of those resistant infections as well. But um, I don't think, yeah, it, it says if it's just from animals, but for a lot of those, you kind of assume they are from animal sources. And then of course, when there are any outbreaks um, for multi-drug resistant bacteria, they will list them on the CDC, um, yeah, or the MMWR, I think weekly and stuff. Um, yeah. Wow, I um, can't believe we're already at time. Um, I thank you all for a wonderful presentation and wonderful questions. I feel like we can do a whole other hour um, just on this topic and the near future. Um, we will have the link and the recording available for you all so you can follow up and take action. Um, and perhaps we can revisit this talk again with the practice work group again in the future. Um, thank you all so much for your time. Um, really appreciate it. And we look forward to rolling up our sleeves and getting to work on this issue. Thank you all. Thank you.